Hi everyone, I'm thriller author J.F. Penn and today I'm here with Simon Koenig. Hi Simon. Hi Joanna, how are you doing? All right. I'm good. So just a little introduction. Simon is the best-selling and award-winning author of 14 novels and is one of Britain's most popular thriller writers and I am thrilled to talk to him today. So <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so Simon, just tell us a bit about your life before writing best-selling thrillers. It's not very exciting, I'm afraid, Joanna. Before I, uh, I've always wanted to write ever since I was a little kid, and so I was always writing stories of some description. But to pay the bills, I, I've, I've done a number of different jobs, from um, bar work to uh, road building, labouring, um, Christmas tree uprooting, but obviously very seasonal work. <laughs> and um, eventually, I, I had a career for some years as a, as an IT software salesman, which uh, <laughs> it never gets a second question. So uh, I. <laughs> I don't know if you want to move swiftly on. I did that for about a decade, and while I did that, I was trying to get published, and eventually I was lucky enough to uh, to get a publishing deal the, the minute I got one, which is pretty much almost 13 years ago uh, today, um, was um, was obviously go full-time, and I've been full-time writing ever since, and uh, I don't want to go back to work anymore. Well, yeah, absolutely. And um, I actually spent 13 years implementing software, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask the second question about that. No, exactly. Um, so our audience is, is predominantly American um, for this, and your books feature a lot of famous British landmarks. So I wondered if you could talk about a couple of places in Britain that are particularly special to you and how they feature in your books. Well, London is the main um, uh, location for the, for the, for the vast majority of the books. I mean, they do move out of the um, out into the UK a little bit more, but as a general rule of thumb, London and in my my latest book um, that's just come out in the states this week, Ultimatum, um, that features a, a very new uh, and very famous uh, London landmark. Now, the Shard. Um, I won't say how it features the Shard, but um, uh, it's uh, it's, a, it's an amazing looking uh, tower. I, I love London anyway to walk around to to see how the old and the new can sort of just live, merge together uh, and the rich and the poor merge together. It's such an amazingly cosmopolitan city. But when you see, when you get on the south bank of the Thames and you see the Shard just sort of stretching up like a, a piece of glass into the sky, it's an absolutely incredible scene. And, and pretty much the moment I, uh, I saw it, I wanted it to feature somewhere in a book. And, and then to move completely all away from from London at the other end of the country in um, uh, my book Stay Alive, um, which I think comes out in the States uh, next year, um, but which is, came out in the UK this year, 2014. Um, it's all about a kayaking trip um, that goes wrong in the wilderness of Scotland. And I spent a few days up um, uh, in a place called Glen Affric, which is uh, a, 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 a huge glen about 20 miles um uh, southeast of, of, of Inverness, and it's it's right in the middle of nowhere. You can't believe in a country as heavily populated and as small as the UK, you can have such an amazing wilderness. But it's, it contains in a magnificent um, ancient pine forest, beautiful waters, and beautiful mountains. And it was a fantastic backdrop to put in the book, and obviously a fantastic. Uh, place to go and do some research yeah anyway, but I want but I yeah. did want to ask you about explosions because you do write you know a lot of action scenes and thriller readers love explosions I love explosions you know I, I love that stuff so I wanted to ask you what do you want to blow up next in your books like have you got like a hit list of things you want to blow up do you know I've never thought about that um but I do quite like a big explosion yeah I don't think I'd like to explode any, any landmarks in London because I quite like them. Um, and I don't really want to lay waste to... I think it's much, much better on the page, to be honest. Um, I would like one time to actually blow something up myself. Something, something that was, you know, ready for demolition. Like one of those big tower blocks they have. I'd like to pull the, you know, push down the, um, uh, the detonation, the, whatever it's called, and, you know, set one of those bombs off. But... Um, uh, I, I've never done it. I have been, I have to say, to um, the Army Bomb Disposal School um, in, in the UK where they told me how to make a bomb um, from um, pretty much from household components, actually, and uh, I, I, which was research for a book. And I've, I've, I've actually handled various plastic explosives 
um, that they let me um, mess around with up there. But um, I've not actually blown anything up as yet. And that's probably no bad thing. <laughs> it's it's all about fun, though, isn't it? The research. So you talked about kayaking there. You talked about the school. What are the other very thrilling things you've done in terms of your research expeditions? Well, I, I, for um, two of my books, actually, uh, were set um, at least partly um, in the Philippines, uh, A Good Day to Die and uh, The Payback, um, neither of which, actually, I don't think have been published in the States yet. So, uh, But anyway, they, they required me... Um, um, going to, to the Philippines and spending some time there moving around the islands and, and checking out and exploring Manila, which is probably one of the most ugly cities in the world because it was the second most bombed city in the Second World War after Dresden. It was bombed both by the Japanese and by the Americans trying to get it back, and so it was completely flattened. And actually, it, it, it's pretty much made up of low low two-story, three-story breeze block buildings all over the place. There's no history. It's an incredibly ugly place, but very, um, very kind of exciting and interesting. And, um, I, yeah, that, that, that's, that's probably my favorite, my, my favorite location for, um, for, for, for research because, you know, it was going to, it's a little bit like the wild west in the Philippines. There's nothing like anywhere else in Southeast Asia. They're, they're a bit more violent. There are a lot more guns about and, you know, there are a lot more soldiers and police and it's all, you know, there's always kind of something going on in the background. Um, and, and so it was an amazing location for the books as well. Mm. And you also have a lot of authentic detail about the UK police, I guess, in particular. Is that something you've also spent time with, like Peter James, for example, goes and like hangs out with the police all the time? How do you do that kind of research? I don't hang out with him as much as he does. I believe he's out with him. Well, he might have joined, to be honest. He's out there that much. Um, personally, no, I, I have a number, um, a fairly small number of really good contacts in the kind of specialist areas of, of Scotland Yard and the Metropolitan Police in the counter-terrorism side and the organised crime side. And if I want to, um, you know, if, I, if I'm moving, I'm, I'm writing a scene and I need to know how the police would react in that scene, what they would do, what kind of devices they have for, um, for, for tracking down, you know, criminals, then I'll, I'll go and speak to them very specifically about it and, and get the information. Um, but I don't do it that often the, these days. I, I find that, you know, it, for me, the, the stories aren't, the important thing is not to make them realistic as such, because obviously, you know, virtually all my books take place in about six hours or eight hours. There's loads of twists and turns. And it's not really, I don't think how, how things happen in real life. Um, but it's important that they're authentic. So I kind of re wear the research fairly lightly. But when I, you know, when I get stuck, I do ask the people with the, uh, the right answers. Mm. So hopefully people won't spot any, uh, any mistakes in there. And then another thing I'm interested in, kind of, because when we're talking, as we're talking, um, it, there's some a lot of political upheaval going on in the world with ISIS in Iraq, and we've got Scot Scottish vote coming up, and interesting things happening. Do you, do you get any ideas from that bigger kind of political scene? Because all your books are very current, very, they feel right right now. Well, yeah, I do. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've written books, um, with, you know, such a siege, an ultimatum where, you know, where, um, they take, uh, you know, things that are happening, uh, in, in the world currently, particularly on the terrorism front, on the Islamic fundamentalism front, um, and, and the rise of sort of separatism. Um, I've taken those on board for the, for the books. Um, you know, you, you always don't, I think you always have to put your own slant on things because I don't, I don't want to write a book that's very specifically current affairs. I, I just think it's good to have a story, um, which, has some, you know, level of escapism from the, the horrible parts of the world that we keep um, hearing about, but at the same time has, you know, the, where, where it's quite obvious that from the plot that, you know, that they are impinging, you know, that those kind of events are impinging a little bit. So I don't know, I kind of mix and match it really. Um, I don't want to, yeah, I, I don't want to get, I don't, I don't want to depress the readers. That's the most important thing. I want to do, it's nice to put the current affairs in, I, you know, they're escapers in my books. They're there for excitement, action, um, twists and turns. And ultimately, I want someone to finish a book and think, oh, I really enjoyed that. And I want to read another of his. Not that, oh, my God, that's so depressing. You know, the world is collapsing all around us. So. <laughs> yeah, we get enough of that on the news. Well, uh, you see, we do. 
<laughs> yeah, so your books are very kind of breakneck speed, um, non-stop. Um, is that how you live your life or what do you do to relax? <laughs> well, it's a good question, actually. I mean, I do, quite, you know, I do quite a lot of exercise. I do sort of, yeah, you know, I do a fair amount of kayaking, although I've never ended up on uh, the kind of trip where uh, people are trying to kill me as they do and stay alive. But um, I've done, uh, yeah, I do quite a lot of outdoor uh, and uh, sort of fairly exciting activities. But at the same time, you know, I, 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 I lead a quite a nice life as well. I mean, when I finish writing for the day, I relax really if I'm really knackered by taking a nice long walk down by the River Thames, where I live, and then come back, cook some dinner, and just slob out in front of the TV, watching usually American box sets and, um, and, and comedy. And that, to me, is a nice way of relaxing. But funny enough, I am quite an impatient person, and I do kind of... Um, I have fairly sort of short attention span a lot of the time. I mean, I can sort of be talking about one thing and suddenly I move very quickly to another and then quickly to another and quickly to another. And a lot of people have described me as fairly manic. So I think maybe that, that that's kind of influenced in, in the books as well. Mm, that, that I couldn't buy a slow one, I don't think. No, I, I guess that. <laughs> no literary <laughs> fiction in your department. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's too slow. I like to, I like things to move fast, but that's how I like to read them as well. I mean, I don't like to pick up a book. It doesn't necessarily have to be a thriller, but a book has got to kind of engage me from sort of the first page, or I don't really give it too much of a chance anymore. And I think a good book can always engage you from the first page, even if it's a fairly slow plot. Um, and so that's what I try to do with my books, and then just keep people, the reader, you know, yanked in and, mm. and yanked in right until the very end. And, and who do you read for pleasure? It really varies, actually, but I, oh, I say it really varies. So that's probably not quite true. I read a lot of crime. So therefore, most of, um, most of my contemporaries I, I, I read. Um, and I read the, the crime, you know, not just for, um, for pleasure, um, but also because, um, you know, if I read a bad book by one of my competitors, it makes me, <laughs> puts me in a good mood thinking, ah, oh, the competition's not doing so well. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit cheeky saying that, but it's, it's partially true. But, uh, no, I enjoy, I love reading crime books. I always have done, and, you know, not just uh, contemporary, but also, you know, historical crime and, and the sort of golden age of crime, 1930s, 40s, you know, Dashiell Hammett, um, Raymond Chandler, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes I read a bit of science fiction and fantasy, and sometimes I read what you kind of describe as literary. I mean, I read um, uh, The Secret History by Donna Tartt, Hmm. A couple we, months ago, which oh, I love. A couple of months ago, that's like 25 years old. I know, I know, it's a bit late, but you know, better late than never. I did try it in 1996 and it was a little bit slow for me, but um, I read it again when actually I was in hospital and, uh, and I was kind of a bit of a captive audience and I found it a fantastic book. But even that has a crime in it, so uh, maybe, you know, maybe people have got to die before I get engaged in a book. That's why we're thriller authors. Everybody has to die. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, at least a few people do. Yeah, a few people, yeah, for sure. So um, what are the themes that obsess you, that, that keep coming up in your writing that you can't escape? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the complete... Uh, the fear that the criminals are winning... Uh, there's always a fear in my books from the police uh, that, 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 that the law doesn't protect the victims as much as it protects the criminals and that this isn't a good thing. So the, the feeling that the police are often um, battling against as much against their superiors and the establishment and the legal system as they are against the criminals is a recurring theme. Uh, and the need by almost all my protagonists, both police or not, to kind of break the rules because the rules themselves are too much of a straitjacket. So there's all this thing about how far do you go to break the rules and and how, you know, how far can you go without becoming a criminal yourself and, and losing the sympathy that, um, you know, you're trying to get uh, and how, you know, how far can you corrupt the sense of, you know, the, the search for justice. So that's the recurring theme that I think has gone through every one of my books and is, is very much in, in the latest book as well. Mm. Um, that's what always interests me. Mm. And uh, the other thing I seem to notice in a couple of your books is is threat to family. And you ha recently had a, a short, th in three parts, book in Dead Man's Gift. You've got the father hunting for his son and there's an uncle. And I noticed that there's family themes as well in your book, w books. Would that be 
True. Yeah, because actually another running theme as I'm thinking about it is often the ordinary person in trouble. So a lot of my protagonists uh, are just an ordinary man or woman that suddenly get themselves flung into a situation um, which over which they have no control and over which they don't know what you know and, and to which they don't know how to to react. And I think um, this that that's that's hugely important to me, but often. When it's an ordinary person, they have a family as well. And often it, it comes to, you know, they're trying to protect their family. And family to me is very, very important. Um, you know, I have two children um, and, you know, I, I'm massively protective over them. And, you know, I suppose when I'm dealing in the books with threat to family, I think of my own kids and how I would feel if they were if they came out of threat. And so that kind of adds an intensity to, to the writing. But, yes, I mean, fear that I have as a, as a parent um, – uh, for my children going out in the world and you know protecting them against the, the all the dangers that are out there, I, I I think you know that's a recurring recurring fear for me, and I think a lot of parents probably can can sympathise with that. Mm. And you know uh, that that impinges a lot of uh, of uh, of the work in the book as well, because you know a lot of the themes in the book run because precisely you know because of that. Yeah, it's fear fear of, of of how your you know how your kids go out in the world and fear of 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 your family being threatened that that's a big you know running thing for me mm. and I, that sort of speaks to the father side of you but how much of uh, other sides of your character are in the characters that you write how much of you is in your characters well i think a lot of every you know a lot of me is in my characters um and i think um that's the case pretty much with um with with any 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 writer i think i mean if you're writing a book you you want to sort of you know it, it's your passions your thoughts your fears i think that go into the characters. i mean obviously the characters are all fictional and in many cases in my ones they're a lot braver than i would be in in a lot of circumstances but you know my sense of that they have my sense of, of fear about the world, they have my sense of in, enjoyment uh, when things go right, my sense of always desiring some form of natural justice as well. I mean, I, I have a great thing about natural justice. I like to see the, you know, the good rewarded and the bad punished. And, and that is a huge theme in my books. And that really, and a huge theme amongst my characters, whether they're the ordinary person in trouble or whether they're the police officer um, you know, trying to find a murderer, they all have that need for natural justice. Um, and, you know, and, I, and I, that, that comes straight from me. Mm. And I, I hope you don't mind me asking this, but um, I heard you speak at uh, Bristol Crime Fest about uh, being abducted. And I wondered if, if you wouldn't mind telling that story, or if not, no worries. <laughs> well, no, but it's a very long story. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah, as a, as a, I, I, I will pricey it down to a short one otherwise we'll be here all afternoon but um it you know i, I was um i was hitchhiking with a couple of friends age 16 when we were um well we, we were picked up by three older guys in a, in a very small car uh, and so we were cramped in a in this car and they um, basically drove us into my hometown uh, late at night and rather than actually drop us off they they tried to rob us and beat us. Well, they didn't try to rob us. They did rob us, beat us, and then drove back out of town with us in the car and um, made us take our clothes off. And, like, you know, it was a really horrible incident where we thought we were going to die. And we were eventually naked and lined up outside the car in the middle of some woods uh, and sort of beaten very badly and then threatened. Um, I think one of them claimed, one, one shout said to another, you know, get the shotgun out. And I think they were, I don't know how much of it was... Um, trying to sort of scare us and, and humiliate us or how much of it was real. And uh, it was, you know, it's a very sort of, one of my friends actually broke free and escaped and that's when they let us go, uh, the other, me and myself and the other friend. Um, but it was a really, really terrifying um, ordeal. Uh, made worse, I think, if we're talking about natural justice by the fact that the police knew very, very quickly who they were, um, but none of them admitted anything under very, very detailed and lengthy questioning. And also um, they never discovered the stolen car that they were in and the police waited weeks and weeks before they came around with um, a book containing photographs, which may or may not have contained these guys. And we couldn't pick out the ones uh, who they were. So we, so they, they were never brought to justice. So that was quite a, 
uh, a difficult thing. But, it was a, but that kind of fear from, you know, that I remember from that night is a kind of fear that you never, ever forget. Um, because actually for some, probably for a half an hour, I really did think I was going to die. And um, at age 16, and having never experienced anything like that before, having come from a comparatively sheltered background and living in a small town, you just don't. And um, it, so it was a pretty... Pretty, pretty traumatic experience. And I think when I'm writing um, from the point of view, particularly of ordinary people, ordinary individuals in trouble who are faced with a really terrifying situation where they think they're going to die, I kind of draw upon my own experiences of that and try to sort of infuse that in the page but through, you know, through their eyes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, hearing you tell that story again, I think it's adds a real powerful side to your writing. I mean, I've read a number of your books before I heard you say that, and um, it, it does really come through. So I think I think that, that shows. So thank you so much for sharing that. I always appreciate your vulnerability, no. I guess. Yeah, it's a funny because I mean, you know, often I tell that story and it's, it's like, it, to get the whole story takes about 25 minutes. It's, it's, it's a long story and it could be put so, but... Um, yeah, I, I, it's funny. I didn't think about it for years and years. I, I really pushed it to one side and, and tried to forget about it. And I never spoke about it with my my two friends, one of whom I still keep vaguely in touch with. I still never, it's still never ever mentioned. Um, and it's only in recent years with the writing that it's come out and that I have talked about it more. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tough yeah, time. Two years ago, I think it was. Jesus, a long time ago, but you never forget it. Yeah. And, I mean, we often write to deal with these things ourselves. Um, do you think people who love thrillers are reading for that vicarious experience? Or why do people love reading books like yours? Well, it's interesting. I think there's a couple of reasons. Yeah, you can kind of live vicariously um, through through the characters. I think it's kind of... It's always quite nice to be sat in the warmth of your house, you know, feeling all cosy in bed maybe, reading a book where some horrendous things are <laughs> happening to people who you could probably you who you can hopefully identify with and think, Oh my goodness, thank God that's not happening to me. That's quite a nice feeling, I always think. Um and I think people just really, really enjoy books where there are plenty of twists and turns, where they don't really know what's gonna happen next, and where they can actually identify with and sympathize with you know, the characters who are their main protagonists. I mean, that's the really important thing about using an ordinary person like um, like I do in a number of books. Like I've, I've used uh, a woman who's, whose um, daughter was kidnapped in Deadline or a man who suddenly finds himself being chased for a reason he has no idea in Relentless. You know, I think that the reader can see these people and think, yeah, actually, yeah, that could be me. And what would I do in those sort of situations? And what's going to happen? And I, that, I think, is the... Um, the real key to why people enjoy them. Mm. Now, I've just seen from your uh, your Facebook that you finished the draft Ooh. of the final minute. So I wonder if you could give any hints of the story and when people can look for that book. I can. Um, certainly in the UK, you'll be able to look for that book in January because there's quite a quick turnaround for me finishing it uh, and it coming out. In the States, it's almost certainly not going to probably be till early 2016. Um, basically, I can tell you what it is about. It's a little bit different to my other ones insofar as it takes place over a slightly longer period of time, i.e. about four days. Um, but it's, um, it starts with a man um, who's lost his memory and he's living with his sister uh, in, a, in a cottage in, in a, the middle of rural Wales. And he's beginning, he's banged his head and he's beginning to wonder if the woman is actually really his sister and then suddenly uh, he comes home um, from a little walk one evening and the woman he thinks is his sister has been tortured to death. Um, the, the male nurse who looks after him has also been killed and there's some people waiting for him and suddenly he's on the run. But the problem he has being on the run is that he doesn't know who he is, but he keeps getting a recurring dream of him being in a house full of dead bodies and he's not quite sure whether he's actually responsible for killing them or not. And so he enlists the help of, of Tina Boyd, um, one of my detective protagonists from a number of the books, but who's now a private detective, to help him find out who he is and, and you know, whether he's actually responsible for, for these killings. And, um, you know, there's quite a... It's a fairly intensely fast book because this guy is being chased and, he, he, and so they need to find out 
and he needs to find out who he is before he actually gets caught and killed because people want some information out of him and he has no idea what that is. So that's pretty much a, a, a synopsis of it. Sounds it's good. It's slightly longer than my normal books, but uh, it's very fast-paced. Mm. I'm doing the rewrites in a moment, so um, and they're going well, I'm pleased to add. Oh, good. Well, we, we let it better let you get back to it then. So um, where can people find you online? Well, I have my website, www.simonkernick.com. And then my public Facebook page. I'm on Facebook, Simon Koenig, author. Um, that's, the, I always think, the best place to catch me because I, don't, I post on there very regularly. And, um, you know, I, I answer emails, whether they come either on the Facebook messages or they come through the website. So either of those two places. And on Twitter, as Simon Koenig as well. So, or Simon.Koenig, I think I am. <laughs> there you go. Fantastic. <laughs> well, thanks so much for your time, Simon. That was great. Oh, thanks, Joanna. No worries at all.